For every single prompt could save you hours, days, or even weeks of design. Make sure your designs are safer, but also leading in the right direction. I'll break down how I've been using AI, some of the pitfalls, some of the things you need to watch out for, and some of the things that will save you time. Now, I'm just gonna start off with a little bit of a disclaimer here because you do need to be careful about where you're inputting your data. Think about anything, any of the free versions of any of the software, even some of the paid ones, you do need to be careful about what use cases they can actually use with your data. As sometimes they can use it on pre-training data or in other places where it could potentially be retrieved if people use the right framing and prompts. So you do need to be a little bit careful, especially with secretive or sensitive information. So you're making sure that you're putting it in a place potentially that is in a business account where you have control of that data instead of that free version of GPT that gets you to the similar answer, but you don't know where that data is going. And why would you think it's free? Another common mistake that I see a lot of people make is they just input a question into a general chat bot. Is it correct? Who knows? Sometimes it's on the right track. Sometimes it's off track. Best way to try and think about AI. It's a very helpful friend or kid. It wants to give you answers regardless of what it knows. It has a lot of knowledge, so it can draw on many different purposes of where it's putting that information in. For you to be able to use it effectively, you need to have a good instruction set that puts it on rails and guides it in the correct path. It's not just about pointing it in the correct path as well, meaning making sure that it's not fabricating references, making incorrect conclusions, and actually referencing good material. For example, if I'm using it for AI, and I'm not just handing over the reins at this point, I'm using it as a quality assurance check. I'm more using it like my best buddy next to me is checking my work and asking inquisitive questions. So not only is it going to a good data source, but it's also not just doing the work for me. So it's not like saying, can you go and design me a whole building? What I might do is throw in some of my designs and say, can you cross check this in a certain way? And how I started off, I normally build up a prompt over a couple of days or weeks and tune it so the output is as I want it to be. Normally setting for a role is the best way to do this. You're saying that you are a structural engineer. You're looking to have radical candor and why do you want to put it something like that? Well, make sure that it's not just praising you as sometimes it's just trying to work out what you want to hear. Where if you say that you want good advice or the tough love is the best course of action, it will potentially give you better advice as opposed to just spouting back what you want to hear. And also making sure that it is being extremely helpful and giving you tips on areas to improve. It can either be prompting questions, it can either be reviewing your documentation to see what it believes is not clear and helping you rework those answers. Where most people start, and this is probably where structural engineers need to be getting into, will improve one area greatly that most of us aren't good at. Now, did you guess right? And that is writing. Writing is probably one of the hardest things that I find as structural engineers to make sure something is clean, clear, and concise. So typically I wanna make sure that my writing is clean. However, if we just put a block of text in and ask it to review, the answers can come out garbled, not really sound like me, and lead down the track of either being more by vote so using words that I wouldn't use. And that dreaded M dash. I would try to get rid of it as basically impossible. This is where if you do want your writing to be more like you, you need to frame it in such a way that it's ghost writing abilities to make sure that you're answering things in a certain way. You also wanna make sure that you're framing it for the type of audience that you're targeted for, but also what type of style of communication. You and engineers, especially in today's day, want to be researching different types of communicators and how you can communicate more effectively. So I won't tell you who my influences are, but you want to make sure you're finding your own influences so that when you're putting the prompt in you're saying i want you to act more like this person a person b and person c who have these type of characteristics so you can help me make my writing sound more like them give me feedback on what the improvements are now that's the key aspect you want to make sure that's accelerating your learning abilities not just taking control so what you want it to do is not only give you some tips and advice on how to improve the writing but also giving you where you let down and things that you can work on it may give you a refined writing at the end but just don't use it what are the time i'm finding for better results is I will rewrite it back in my own words. I'll use it as the framework of what I'm trying to put out, but then use that to help refine my writing quicker and faster, but also rewrite it back from scratch. So making sure that I'm removing some of those M dashes and grammar it would put in there that I wouldn't typically use. I'm also putting framing into the initial prompt that says these are the type of communications that you want to avoid. But some of the biggest aspects that I've seen for improvement is having good and bad examples of the outputs. So typically I'll have the bad examples of what it initially output which, to be fair, sometimes, especially over a period of time, aren't too bad. But they are rooms for improvement, where you put the final output that you potentially wanted to put in there, 
in the good prompt. So it becomes more and more like you over time. That collation of good and bad examples is something that's really important. This is also how I potentially build on other prompts as well. Those good and bad examples is something that makes it very easy to find the correct answers. For example, if I want it to be a critique of my presentations, I collate a really good set of good examples and I collect a really good set of bad examples that allow me to compare what I like and what I don't like. And so I'll feed in the good examples and say, can you work out what I like about these examples and also critique them for how they are? But these are ones that I feel are good. There may be still room for improvement, but you can review the type of style that I'm trying to go for. And now here's also a list of bad examples that I've come up with in the past. So this takes a little bit longer as you do need to collect them over time. But with that, you can then build it up such that it's got the good examples or the bad examples of seeing what is good and bad, refining what your style is and what you like and what you don't like. So what you wanna be doing is collecting these series of prompts or either having it as an agent or predefined prompt set that you'll put in at the start of the communication to make sure it's going down the right path. That was actually a really good tip. Now this will work for both presentation and for writing is that giving it a magnitude of improvement. Just say, you wanna say, I want you to make this a hundred times clearer and you'll find the outputs will be a lot more cleaner or a lot more smooth. And then you can actually change the number depending on how much you want to make it towards that way. Sometimes you might say a thousand and it just becomes a single line or dot point and it's not really what you wanted. You can go 100, 50, 25, and it gives it a scale of how much to change that document towards what you're heading towards. The other way that you can also work on it is sort of setting up a premise of telling it what you want it to do. So you potentially start with, I first want to help you write a, me a prompt that does X, Y, Z. So I want to make sure that it has these type of characteristics. It behaves in this way. It's giving good or bad advice towards things. And it's providing this type of guidance or looking for certain patterns. For example, the biggest things that I found, especially in AI and the recent models, is the fact that it has really great pattern recognition. So if you do need to look for patterns in things, typically, especially we're talking about structures and looking for patterns is something that's really important. You can have it review the drawings and get through the patterns that you may be missing. But having it there to also be that prompter, just say if you've got some good advice that you may even look over for yourself, but having that prompt that will give you the guidance or prompt you for additional questions to make sure that it has enough clarity. Especially if you're gonna have it check your engineering work. It's putting it on guardrails saying, these are the type of codes that you need to focus on. These are the areas that we need to limit our information to. So it's really broken down to those specific areas. A lot of the times it's always wanting to give you answers. And if you don't tell it what to do, if it's unsure, it'll just give you a response as it's trying to be helpful. Or if you say, if anything's unclear or unsure, or you don't know what the answer will be, then saying, this is the next steps that you do. You either ask questions or just say that you need to clarify things. Just saying, I'm unsure of these results. It means that it just won't spit out something when it's a little bit unclear of what the correct response should be. This typically leads to a great communication back and forth with it. Now I find a lot of the time, the more conversational you are with the chatbot, the better the results will be as well, as it's being more clear and guidance on the what you want to do. But also what you need to be making sure is that knowing what the benefits are of the different models that you have available to you. It's not necessarily just jumping on the best and smartest models of the time. Yes, you do want to be up with the latest models, but some of the models are better at one thing. For example, writing is not necessarily great in a thinking model, where more something like a 4.1 or 4.5 will potentially produce better results. Where if you need something that needs a lot of deep thinking, processing and getting to the right answer, that's where something like a more expensive model like O3 or Gemini Pro will potentially produce even better results. And something I've been using it for, it's for helping me generate my math dot calculations. Did you know that if you output it the right way, I can just copy the output out of that system, get that result and paste it into the math dot and produce a whole math dot just with a couple of clicks and seconds? Yes, you do need to cross check it. And as again, it's not handing across the reins, but it's using you to get to the better answers. You ask it to include the clauses, you go back and check the clauses, and you're making sure that it's headed down the right path, but it's a great way to generate some quick responses and calculations that you need. So it means that I can ask it more complex questions and ask it to head down this certain path. And after you start to build up these libraries, you start to turn them over the time, you start to improve them, you can then hand them off to other colleagues as well. Too often people have just tried it in the early days, not really done a proper prompt and really led to the bad result. Other people are potentially getting distracted and relying it on too much or being too much second guessing what the response would be. So you'll have these people that will be slowed down by it. You'll have these people that will be using it a little bit, have these people that ignore it, but then 
if you use it correctly, I found that you can amplify your designs, your workflows, and your outputs two, three, even four times as much as you needed to. If you're worried about engineering and will it take over jobs, I've got a link to a video here that I did earlier about AI and engineering into the future. And if you're interested in supporting your channel, there's two ways that you can do this. You can either become a YouTube or Patreon member. Without the support of my YouTube and Patreon members, this type of content would not be possible. As always, keep learning and I hope to see you next time.